welcome to Essential Ingredients, powered by Next Gen Purpose. EI serves up thoughtful conversations with industry leaders and pioneers who support a regenerative future for our food system. The stories shared by our guests are meant to spark curiosity and inspire informed global change. Good morning and welcome to Essential Ingredients. I'm your host, Justine Reichman. With me today is Sasha Milstein uh, from Brooklyn, who lives in Brooklyn, and she is the founder of Aunt Ethel's. Welcome, Sasha. Thank you, Justine. Nice to be here. It's great to have you here. I'm so excited. And you're in my city. So how is it there today? It is gorgeous and sunny. It's going to be 83 degrees, and I'm looking to definitely grab dinner outside later tonight for sure. Oh, my God. That sounds amazing. It's a little chilly here. We have a wind. I feel like it, I'm an, a, uh, what do you call it, a um, weather person. What do you call the weather people? Oh my um, God, a, a senior meteorologist. A medi- I feel like a meteorologist. We're having a, a cold front come in today. It's going to be a, a balmy 54 degrees. It is sunny. <laughs> it is coming in a northwest. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> it's gusty. So anyway, Sasha, I'm so excited. I can't wait to try Aunt Ethel's pot pies. And my grandmother's name was Ethel. So the minute I saw that, I was like, oh. Love it. Everybody somehow seems to have some tangential connection, whether it's an aunt or a mother or a grandmother. So it's definitely a family name and a household name. It, it is. So who is Aunt Ethel? That's a great question. So she is, in fact, a real person, um, but her first name is Alicia. Her middle name is Ethel. Uh, We came up with the name Aunt Ethel's um, on a trip to Vietnam, as one does, uh, riding in the van with the whole family. Yeah. And uh, we came up with the idea, the concept the night before. And then I pitched the idea to the whole family the next day as we were driving from Hoi An to to, uh, Hanoi. And I said, okay, well, what, what should I call the company? And they were like, uh, I don't know, like something like chicken pot pie posse or chicken pot pie fam. And I, and I was like, CPPC. And my mom was like, I think that's an old Russian, like USSR acronym. So maybe stick away from that. So um, <laughs> my aunt, who has a very uh, New York accent, was like, well, you know, my middle name is Ethel. I've always thought it was so ugly, but if I was ever to like run a diner or do something like old school, I think it'd be a great name. And we all hemmed and hawed over Ethel and we're like, yeah, that makes sense. And then my mom chimes in, well, she's your aunt. So why don't you name an aunt Ethel's? And that was literally like how we came to it. (laughs) Wasn't any major epiphany, just (laughs) made sense. So you guys were on this trip and you were saying the night before you came up with the idea for the pot pies, what inspired this? Idea. Yeah, so we have to give credit where credit is due. Um, while I was on the trip, I was listening to How I Built This by Guy Raz, and I was listening to the episode about chicken salad chicks, about this woman who started selling chicken salad door to door and ended up creating like one of the largest fast casual restaurants. So that evening, my aunt and I went out for drinks as we were watching the sunset. I was telling her about the story. And I said to her, you know, you've been so successful since she was, she's been a professional caterer in New York City for the last 30 years. And uh, I said to her, you know, you've been so successful for 30 years. Like, what is one product that like all of your clients absolutely adore? And she thought about for a second and came back and said, you know, probably my chicken pot pie. Took a sip of my tamarantini then looked at her and went on this diatribe about, yes, the chicken pot pie. It's the great common denominator. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, black or white, liberal or Republican. I'm like, it it brings everybody together. And she looked at me and said, you're drunk. (laughs) And I said, yes, probably. But at the same time, I said, Pot pies have been around for so long and they've just been executed so poorly that it's about time that we launch a gourmet pot pie, you know, that you can reheat in a short amount of time. And that was all it took. Finished our tamarantinis, went to bed and then announced to the whole family the next day, starting a chicken pot pie company. Wow. I love that. And, you know, it really does come from, you never know where inspiration is going to come from, right? Exactly. Never yeah. Where inspirations come from. And before this, what were you doing? So before this, um, I was doing um, 
sales uh, in real estate, as well as um, angel investing. I got involved with 37 Angels, which is a female-run organization here in New York City. I know that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's run by Angela Lee, who's incredible. Right. And um, a number of years ago, some friends of mine came to me and asked me to invest in their yoga studio. And before I did that, I just did like a quick Google search as far as like what type of documents are needed, you know, what are the... Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are the standards? Like, how much do you invest? What kind of equity do you take? And I realized I had no idea what I was doing. So I ended up finding out about 37 Angels, signing up for their four-day boot camp. And after that, like, you know, I couldn't stop doing it. Like, it's the women that are involved in 37 Angels are incredible. Some of them manage their family funds. Others, you know, have just worked really hard their whole lives, you know, sort of like myself and accumulated some assets to be able to invest in companies. And over the over the few years, you know, that I did it, I ended up investing in a number of different CPG companies. And so obviously I became familiar with what that term even meant right. and um, what it took to run a company. And I was just highly fascinated by the people that ran it. I love the industry and the community. And I didn't even think that I would ever be involved because I thought to myself, well, who who the heck am I to be a founder of a company? You know, that takes somebody really, you know serious and intelligent. But, you know, for the last 10 years, my aunt and I have always wanted to work together. She asked me for many years to take over her catering company. I have no idea how to cook. So that was just a hard no. <laughs> and um, she then asked me to, you know, sell her book of business, which I told her she made, you know, a critical error by making herself her brand. So anybody she sold her book of business to, her clients weren't going to work with because they worked with her, right. you know. So this was like that epiphany that went off where I was like, wait a second, this, I can like help essentially take over the company by taking one component of it, commercializing it, scaling it up, and then rolling out all these other products that you've had in your repertoire, you know, for 30 years that are all tried and true and convert this into a household brand name. And her response was, you think like such a man with your big ideas. <laughs> I go, by the end of this, you're going to be telling me that I think like such a woman with these big ideas. <laughs> that was so smart. So, I mean, I love that. I want to just go back to the 37. I'm sorry. Remind me of the name. 37, 37 Angels. 37 Angels. So do you think that doing that little program, if you will, right, uh, really set you up to be successful in this next venture? Or do you think you, regardless, it would have been the same? I think founders, especially like startups, um, view angel investing and like raising capital is super intimidating. And they don't realize how, I'm going to offend a lot of people when I say this, like how hey, rudimentary. Go for it. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> In other words, people invest based on emotion, you know, and, and back it up with logic. But like given, you know, the way that 37 Angels was set up is Angela and two other people would vet 9,000 companies and condense it down to nine companies per quarter, okay? Those nine companies would then go in and pitch 30, 40 Angels, you know, in a room. We would then, after hearing seven-minute pitches, we would then vote on the top three that we wanted to delve into, we would then, you know, speak to the founder for an hour or two in a conference room. And then all of us would collectively write up a due diligence memo. And then we would all invest independently. But like, what, do, I mean, how much do you really know about the company, you know, that you're investing in? You're investing in the founder, the, the founder exactly. The founder. You're investing in the jockey, you know, not the horse. And that's really like, so that aspect of it, you know, helped kind of like tear down the intimidating walls of like fundraising. Um, and obviously getting to know a lot of founders and seeing that like, you know, they started from means of, of nothing. Like, it's not like, it's not like anybody has a background of entrepreneurship. It's not like you can be like, oh, at your last entrepreneur job, you know, it's the same thing as like running for president. It's not like, so you were formerly a president of where? No, <laughs> you know, so I guess that whole like intimidation veil, you know, kind of came down for me by investing, you know, with 37 angels, which was helpful. And so did you then, when you started, um, uh, and Athos, did you go to look to raise money? No, surprisingly, <laughs> I, 
I did contact Angela and she was like, great, great, great. All sounds good. She's like, contact me when, you know, you start generating revenue and you guys hit a quarter of a million dollars. And I was like, sounds good. I'll speak to you in five years. Okay. <laughs> so um, we're not quite there yet, but we definitely are on our way. Um, up until now, I've just been bootstrapping, you know, taking out loans, um, little, you know, raising from some family and friends, you know, who've contacted me and interested in the idea. And, um, you know, I think if you're round enough and you have enough touch points that people find out about you, I had a gentleman contact me who was a very successful CPG company um, who read an article about our company and about our product and contacted me and said, I want, I'd like to invest in your company, whatever it takes. So I think if you're around long enough, you know, and you just keep at it, you know, people, I think anybody who's successful looks back and says, I, I want to give back to, you know, the earlier generations or where I was, you know, 30 years ago. I mean, I know I do. That was one of the things that I like, one of the reasons I started the company, I said, after I sell this company and exit for a few hundred million dollars, I want to take that money and then I want to travel around the world giving back and doing microfinancing for other women who didn't have the same resources and access to, you know, capital that I had. That's amazing. So out of curiosity, so you're bootstrapping this and what does that look like for you? And what are the challenges you're faced as a result? Um, homelessness? I don't know. No, <laughs> Um, it's really stressful. You know, I've always obviously like worked for somebody else. I've always had, you know, a paycheck coming in and, um, you know, I just didn't expect, uh, starting a company to require this much capital. You know, um, I also didn't expect us to be unprofitable for the first, you know, year or two. I assumed, you know, I'd start selling Popeye's and I'd start making money and that would be the end of it. But there's a lot of costs that go into it. And also the cost of making mistakes is really high, which I don't fault myself for, but you, you almost need that, that leeway, that capital leeway to be able to make the mistakes, especially when you're young and you're small, so that you don't you know, make them when you're much larger and more substantial. Right. And so as you're on this journey and you're bootstrapping it, what are some of the choices you've made or had to make in order to be able to continue moving on that have been really hard for you? That's a tough question. <laughs> um, there have been times that I've had to stop production and manufacturing because we've just run out of space. Uh, we started this company, you know, two, three years ago, expecting to onboard with a co-packer and so this day, we still do not have a co-packer in place. I didn't realize the challenge of, you know, onboarding with a co-packer, finding that co-packer. It's sort of like, you know, finding that glass slipper. You know, I say to people, like, it's almost as tough as, you know, finding your spouse or your partner. And it took me 43 years to do that. So, you know, I, it may take me a few more years to find a co-packer that's the right fit. You know, it has so much to do with timing because in the beginning of the pandemic, when we started looking at co-packers, they were really overwhelmed with a lot of other CPG companies or D to C companies that converted to wholesale companies. And they were also short of labor. And so it was a much bigger challenge to find a co-packer that was going to take you on. Now things have kind of settled down a little and it's easier. And we are currently in discussions with a co-packer that hopefully will be onboarded with by the time I speak to you next. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yes. Fingers and crossed. toes. <laughs> yes. And toes. And toes. So, you know, that, that's a really big challenge. And, and that's because of the bootstrapping. Do you think? No, I don't think it's the bootstrapping at all. I think it's just, you know, a numbers game. You know, we've spoken to hundreds of co-packers. We've hired two consulting companies and nobody's been able to find the right co-packer. Also, we have a little bit of a challenging product because we have like a soup kettle product, but then we also have like a bakery product, you know, which is our crust. And so to find that perfect, you know, fit is is a little challenging you know and co-packers also go through their own 
financial challenges where, you know, they don't predict like the right margins. Like we were onboarding with a co-packer and then they couldn't afford to stay in business. And so they ended up uh, renting out two thirds of their space. And so didn't have the bandwidth or the capacity to take us on. Right. Yeah. So I'm curious, I just want to change directions for a minute. Um, talk to me about the ingredients. Yes. So that's been really the easiest part of this whole entire <laughs> This whole journey is that the product itself has been around for 30 years. So my aunt back in the 80s worked for a company called Word of Mouth, and it was sort of the predecessor to Citarella. Most New Yorkers, especially if you lived on the Upper East Side, um, would go there. They would always get like salads and pastas and, you know, hot entrees and whatnot. And um a few years into it, the owner unfortunately passed away suddenly. And my aunt at the time was catering for all of these clients. And so when she, you know, continued catering, they would come back to her and say, you know, it's too bad that word of mouth is no longer around. I used to love their chicken pot pie, or I used to love their beef bourguignon or their meatloaf. And she said to them, well, actually, you know, I have all the recipes. And that's how she started doing like a whole retail line. So when I came to her and I said, you know, you know, what's one of your favorite products? She immediately said her chicken pot pie because she knew that, um, you know, that was one of the products that people loved and people, you know, continued to purchase um, year in, year out for 30 years. So the product itself was already kind of presented to me. We then took like something like the cocoa van, which wasn't obviously traditionally served as a pot pie converted to that. And then when we needed a vegetarian one, we took the lentil chili and converted it to that. But one of the things that my aunt always yells at me about is that you have to respect the product and you can't cut corners and you have to, you know, you have to execute it right. You have to execute it with love. You have to execute it with, you know, care and, you know, caution, because that's the problem with a lot of these, you know, pot pies on the market is they're all commercialized, institutionalized, and you can tell that they cut a lot of corners just for profit. So when you say they're cutting corners, is it about the quality of the ingredients? Yes, exactly. Yeah, like for example, um, the roasted chicken, uh, you know, we were going to use um, a thigh, but my aunt refused to, because she said, you know, you need the tenderness of the breast and you need to be able to roast it so that it stays moist. Um, what's another thing? Oh, the leeks, the leeks. I was like, why would we need leeks when we have onions? And she was, she goes, you don't understand. You're going to change the whole ecosystem of the pot pie, which is why you have to include leeks. So we may end up going bankrupt because of the respect <laughs> we have for the product, but it's what you got to do to carry on tradition. So, you know, of course, I, I don't, you know, our podcast is about building a better for you food system. And, yes. You know, creating greater access to healthy food. And, and I've read that you guys are really focused on creating healthy, delicious pot pie. Talk Absolutely. About how they are healthier than the average pot pie. Well, first and foremost, they use real ingredients. Like we have very much like a Julia Child's perspective on food, which is that, you know, you don't, you don't use any kind of like diet products or preservatives or anything, you know, that's going to minimize it. You use full flavor. We use butter, you know, we use cream, we use like fresh vegetables um, and then the other part is that, you know, you just don't eat like a pig, you know, instead of having like 20 ounces, we have 12 ounces. Um, so as far as like the product, it's super healthy in the sense that there's no bottom or side crust. Uh, we removed that because we just found that it got mushy and soggy. So that thereby takes down um, the calorie take to 50%. And then... Um, Everything's just, you know, just fresh. Uh, chicken is hand pulled. We use garden fresh veggies and the puff pastry is, you know, made with real butter. And I'm curious, is it organic or it's not organic? Or so it is, it is all organic. We just haven't gotten the organic certification yet. That's very and expensive. Yes. And we were waiting to do that till we onboarded with a co-packer as well. And does, the, how does that impact uh, the co-packer you choose? Is that making it more difficult to find a co-packer that, you know, deals with organic 
um, for you? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, they need to be USDA certified. Once we get through that, then it just becomes a matter of, you know, whether or not we want a gluten-free certification, do we want an organic certification? And that's something that we can work on specifically with the co-packer. In other words, even if they're not a U, uh, excuse me, an organic certified co-packer, we can order whatever ingredients we need to make it organically certified. Okay, so that does not impact it. And do you guys have a gluten-free option? We do. So Wait, the lentils- can I get that? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get all of them, regardless if you eat them or give them to your friends. Um, as Florence Fabricant from the New York Times said, you know, they're so good that I could serve them at, you know, dinner parties. Okay, so, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, so the lentil chili, we actually, um, we inadvertently uh, made it gluten-free only because when we started selling the, the lentil chili, people came back to us and said, look, I understand why it's a lentil chili, but why is it a lentil chili pot pie? And we were like, well, what else would you like to see with it? And they said, oh, you know, tortilla strips or pita chips. So we ended up actually making it with tortilla strips. Oh, I And that's love how it that served idea. today. That's great. I lived in Mexico City for two years. Oh, and nice. I just love, I always love tortilla chips and chili chilies and anything that you can integrate with that. So yeah. that's great. So you guys have been around since, what was the date that you guys launched? So we officially launched in January of 2022. No big, you know, launch date, just me in my Subaru delivering to the first grocery store. So, so you've been around now, so it's, it's, you know, it's still new and it so is. what are you looking at in the, ne in the next couple of years? What are you, how do you see the trajectory going for Aunt Ethel's? Uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully we'll be building a Popeye empire and every single person and their mom will be eating our Popeye's. No, I mean, I think when, we, when I got into this, I assumed that I would have exited, you know, in three years time. Now I realize that overnight success comes, you know, in the form of 10 years in the making. And so, you know, I've learned to kind of limit my, uh, you know, my expectations and just to learn how to grow the company cautiously and methodically and slowly. So in the next few years, um, obviously we want to be with at least one, if not two co-packers in order to be able to source and scale the whole country. Um, we want to obviously be in like with a number of distributors and we want to see ourselves, uh, probably in like a, you know, big store like Costco, which has always been, you know, a dream of mine, whether or not it's in the current form or if it's in like a 12 pack, excuse me, 12 pack of like Popeye juniors, you know, whatever it takes to get in there. Because I grew up, you know, in Seattle with a family of five, we were the first family lined up at Costco and it had such an impression on me growing up and su surprisingly like the options have not changed since the 80s you know you still have the bagel bites and the bagel dogs oh my god I haven't even thought of those in 100 years yeah wow. they're not the healthiest so to be able to provide like after school snacks to kids you know like myself growing up um, but have it be you know a little bit healthier and more nutritional would be like really like a goal of mine Wow. So I know that you founded this. This is, you're the founder of this company. And so what role is your aunt playing in it? Great question. Uh, it changes day to day. I will say this. There's not a day that goes by that I don't speak to her. Um, I'd like to say she's the ambassador. And obviously she's the face of the product. Although she says, oh, I look nothing like that. But I tried to explain to her, it's more of a caricature to live on in infamy after both of us are gone. Um, but she is, I mean, she's been an incredible mentor, an incredible resource. You know, I've, I've gotten to know her in so many different ways that I never knew her just because, you know, we're now on the same, you know, playing field as far as business. And I get to know more about her company in terms of catering. She gets to know more about my company in terms of CPG. Um, but she's definitely a pivotal role. And, you know, I started this company really, you know, with her in mind to help, um, you know, carry her legacy over. So hopefully I don't disappoint her. I'm sure you won't. And do you think you'll add additional SKUs going forward? Yeah. So over the last year or so, we've gotten a lot of feedback, obviously, regarding, you know, plant-based SKUs. Um, everybody and their mother seems to be vegetarian, although nobody calls it that anymore. They all oh, say you're plant-based. Plant 
plant exactly or yeah or flexitarian or whatever <laughs> or they're using so you know we did take a step back because all of my aunt's recipes are, a lot of them are meat focused just because they're you know a lot of them from the 80s they're very like julia child inspired so we decided um a few months ago to do some recipe formulation and to come up with two new vegetarian uh, flavors. So we came out with the roasted cauliflower that has a cheddar velute and garden fresh veggies. And then we also came out with a, which the name I love, it's called Shrooms Gone Wild. I'm sure you can understand wow. <laughs> the similarity to the other name that you know goes in for shrooms. Um, and that's a medley of porcinis and cremini's with a um, herb and cream base. That sounds amazing. That sounds so. When do you expect that you'll have those um, available? So we just finalized the design and the graphics um, on the overwrap. So as soon as we get them printed and manufactured, we're going to be off to the races. So I was, I would imagine, in the next few months. Oh, that's exciting! So you're going to have more SKUs available. So have <laughs> you guys, out of curiosity, looked at like Pod Foods or anything? We have not. I mean, I know of them. We just have not. They're a distributor, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we're, we just, we're not ready to onboard with a distributor, um, specifically because we just don't have the production levels to support that. So you are looking at our distributor. Um, but and as soon as we do a good job, it's very personable this way. Exactly. But that's the thing is like, you have to really understand what it takes for in every position of the company, you know? So I love like putting the cases, you know, in the back of my car, driving them over, talking to, you know, Luis or, you know, Ruben or whoever's the salesperson there, um, helping them merchandise it, helping them figure out where it's going to be on the shelf, you know, hearing about their family, you know, catching up with them. So it's all part of the building blocks. Yeah, building it system. establishes great relationships for you to be able to then move forward. The challenge, not the challenge, but I think, you know, when you go to move forward and you expand and you grow, replicating that and getting that person or those salespeople that can then do that for you becomes, you know, they have to then be you. Exactly. Yeah. They have to present the product with the same amount of enthusiasm, the same amount of passion. Exactly. And hopefully after trying it, they will feel that way. But, um, you know, our pitch is pretty straightforward, which is, you know, this is a gourmet artisanal pot pie that you can reheat in five minutes and have it taste like it's been baking in your kitchen all day. There's nothing on the market like this. So, um, you know, it's easy to justify taking off another pot pie and replacing it with ours. Well, I'm excited to try it. And, and I'm just curious. I, I know this goes back a minute, but when you said... You, know, you had originally planned to exit in three years, and then you realized that it was going to take you 10. Yes. Right? Okay, fair enough, because I think that that's a realistic assessment, right? We saw Oatly. Oatly, we thought, happened overnight, but when you dig in, you realize that nothing happens overnight, right? Exactly. I think it's completely realistic, but how did that make you feel when <laughs> When you had this realization that, oh my God, my plan, my plan was to exit in three years and it seems like it's going to be a little bit longer. Yeah. It just made me realize this is going to take me into retirement, that I, there won't be another job after this. And, and how do you feel about that? It actually made, it actually relaxed me because, you know, especially in the last few years with, you know, a lot of these companies being fueled by like venture capital, as well as, um, you know, IPOing on the market and then watching their stocks take off and then watching everything crash and burn, you realize that like nothing good happens overnight. And to get caught up in that, that chaos and that excitement and that enthusiasm isn't sustainable. So it really does take the pressure off of you and allows you to really enjoy the process, enjoy the journey and not like suffer from, you know, you know, why aren't I in like every single Whole Foods, like by the end of the week, you know, if it takes three years to get there, that's what it takes. But at right. least like you have all the experience, you know, and the numbers to back you to know exactly why you're there, you know, and, and what it took to get there as opposed to like suffering from imposter syndrome, which is, you know, I launched the company this week and we're going to be in all Whole Foods next week. No. You know, it takes, it takes a lot to scale up and a lot of money and you just, you need to be patient. 
I, I totally agree. And when you had first started this, did you plan to go raise money and take it, get institutional funding and, and then, you know, go public? Was that a thought? Yeah, I mean, I thought that, um, listen, you know the, how crazy it's been in the last few years, you know, people investing in companies without even seeing them, especially like, I know that a lot of like male founding companies, you know, they come up with an idea and then they go around and they pitch, you know, venture capitalists or angel investors before they even come out with it. But there have been enough of these failed companies to know that like, you really need to bootstrap and you need to prove your product market fit and your business model. And you need to at least, you know, generate enough where I hopefully you're profitable before you start putting other people's money on the line. Yeah. And I think that's just good, like ethical business. And also like setting, you know, investors expectations. These are not tech companies. We're not going to be exiting at 100x. Maybe we'll exit at 5x, you know. So do it for the love of the product, the love of the founder, and not necessarily the love of the bank account. Awesome. Sasha, thank you so much for joining me today. I mean, it was fascinating to hear about your experience and all that you're doing and where you're going. And I can't wait to follow along. And if I hear of any um, places for uh, co-packing, I'll make sure to connect you with them. Thank you so much. Not just like that's a common uh, problem I'm hearing around. So yes. And as and as they say in uh, for the Passover Seder, next year hopefully we'll be in Marin celebrating. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. So anyway, thanks so much for joining me. Happy to be here. Thanks. To learn more about these episodes and access show notes, go to nextgenpurpose.com and choose podcast. If you like this episode, head to Apple Podcasts or your favorite platform to subscribe and leave us a review. Visit the Next Gen Purpose YouTube channel to subscribe to our EI videocast and give this episode a like while you're there. Follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn at Next Gen Purpose and connect with me on LinkedIn or Instagram at Justine underscore Reichman. Thanks for joining us.